Well, hello everyone to our next Islands Matter webinar. And today it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Sarah Ann Munoz, who um, we work together. We, we uh, joint supervise a, a very interesting PhD on um, Shetland healthcare before the NHS, um, which we'll be meeting again in a couple of hours to talk to the uh, the PhD student. So um, we've had some really interesting uh, discussions over the the last year, and I'm hoping to get Sarah Ann involved in the Scottish Islands 2050 uh, workshops. Um, and who knows, we might be doing some other uh, work together in the islands. And uh, today, um, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, about some research that uh, Sarah Han has been doing into the uh, mental health needs of Scottish rural populations and, of course, in this context, in the island um, populations as well. Um, so, with that, uh, welcome, Sarah Ann. It's great to have you. It's great. Thanks very much. So, I will just uh, hopefully share my screen. Hopefully, you can see that okay. Yeah, we can. Great. Um, so thanks um, very much, Andrew, for the, the invitation to, to take part in the, um, the series of webinars. Um, it's much appreciated. So um, I'm a, a professor of rural health um, at UHI. I'm based here in Inverness. Um, my uh, background is in health geography, so I'm a, a social scientist and um, I'm really interested in, in the connections between uh, health and well-being and, and place. Um, and uh, one area um, of particular interest for me is mental health and well-being. Um, so I'm primarily a qualitative researcher, so I've been involved in work that's looked at mental well-being um, through methods like interviewing, um, focus groups, um, observation. Uh, and some of that um, has been um, involved um, spending time in the, the Scottish Island groups and speaking with residents and, and healthcare professionals um, and third sector um, professionals who um, are delivering mental health services. So um, I'd like to, to reflect on some of that work today. Um, it's very much a, a team effort um, and the, all the UHI colleagues listed here have contributed to the work that I'll talk about today and, and to the development of this presentation. And I'll also draw on uh, some work that was carried out by uh, my colleague, Dr. Janet Heaton, um, a recent mapping review of uh, the mental health literature related to the, the Scottish Islands, which um, we can share as well if um, people are interested in that as a, as a, a resource. Um, so I'm not an islander myself. Um, I am from uh, rural uh, lowland Scotland. Um, I grew up in Angus. Um, I've spent time on the islands as a, a researcher um, and also um, for my own <laughs> uh, leisure <laughs> as well. Um, but I do recognise that um, my own positionality and that um, you know the residents of the islands are those that are the, the real experts and the people with lived experience around um, the challenges, the needs, the um, assets uh, that are that are within the island groups. So. Um, my work over the last kind of 10 years or so wouldn't have been possible without the generosity um, and often the very wonderful hospitality of the, the people of the island. So thank you to, to everyone as well who's taken part in the research um, over the years. So I want to um, think about mental health. Um, so um, what is mental health is actually one of the questions or what does mental health mean to you and um, was one of the questions that um, we'll come back to because we asked that with some of our uh, focus groups. Um, I think just to start with one of the um, more formal definitions, I quite like um, this one. It's actually from the United States uh, Department of Health um, and Human Services, and they define mental health as including emotional, psychological and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others and make choices. Mental health is important at every stage of life from childhood and adolescence through to adulthood. So um, we can see that mental health is about much more than um, diagnosed mental illness. 
Um, and it's also something that has quite wide ranging impacts and effects on our lives and our experiences, our relationship with others, for example. Uh, so my background um, is health geography, so I've got that interest in place um, and uh, I, I feel like there's a, a strong link between place and, and mental health and well-being. Um, and I think this is to do with um, a, a quite complex set of interrelationships between uh, well-being and the different environments and, and conditions in which we live. So that might be our social environment, cultural, economic, um, physical, natural environment. Uh, and these things can um, impact our um, access to support or to services. Um, that can be geographical, physical access, but also um, social, cultural norms around acceptability can influence uh, people's um, ability and willingness to, to access services. So those are the kind of um, topics that we're interested, particularly interested in within uh, the research in, in UHI Rural Health. Um, I mentioned that uh, much of my work's been uh, qualitative, so speaking with rural community members and, and healthcare professionals. Um, so I thought I'd start by um, pulling out three themes which I think are evident across uh, various pieces of, of qualitative research and evaluation that we've undertaken over the years. Um, and firstly, that was around um, when we were speaking to uh, many um, of our island based interviewees. So that's both healthcare professionals and, and community members. Uh, they often talk about a gap um, in mental health services. And they highlight that it can be difficult to access specialist services and facilities in particular, which might be in Inverness or Aberdeen, um, particularly if somebody is experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, and they also talk about how this is something that they worry about. Um, so even if they are not um, immediately needing to access service or know someone that needs to access a service, um, there is a kind of low level worry that it might not be available when needed. Um, and often people talk to us about that in relation to uh, youth mental health. Um, and I think that this kind of level of worry is probably been exacerbated um, over the course of the pandemic as well. Um, and I've often, I've often talked to people about um, the need to travel um, for mental health treatment um, or therapy. And that often can be um, a discourse that's framed quite um, negatively. Um, people talk about different kinds of costs that are involved um, in that um, need to, to move. Um, and that can be a financial cost, um, a personal, emotional um, or a time cost, for example, time away from family or away from work. Um, but people also um, speak about um, the negative side of actually divorcing their therapy or their recovery um, from the spaces in which they live and in which they their everyday lives are experienced. So um, I think it's it's something that sticks with me from speaking to people and um, saying, you know, my my life's here, but then my um, experience of recovery has had to be somewhere else. And that being kind of um, a, 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 a strange um, experience for them uh, that they would have preferred to um, go through that therapeutic process in their own um, communities. So I mentioned um, my colleague Dr. Keaton's work as well. So I thought it would be um, nice just to, to outline um, what was found in that mapping review, which looks across um, the wider literature around mental health in Scottish islands and was conducted um, earlier this year. Uh, so it's a really good resource if you're looking for um, uh, an overview and also the, the references to the, the different studies. Um, so she found 53 uh, studies that included, uh, to some extent, uh, reference to the, the Scottish islands um, and mental health. So they were um, in the time period between 1977 and 2022. Um, I think Western Isles was the um, largest proportion within uh, the work. Um, and that Orkney was particularly, I think, underrepresented within the, the literature. 
there's some common uh, topics um, that have been pulled out from the, the breadth of work. So those are around things like telehealth, uh, social prescribing, um, and also participation in cultural and community led projects and the link between that and um, positive mental health and wellbeing. But within that um, literature, there's less on the connection between island life and mental health and well-being. So less um, consideration of the nature of place and environment and how those um, may interact with mental health. Some of the themes within uh, the studies themselves are around that access to specialist services, um, linking to that notion of, of worry and, and gaps. Uh, Things around stigma, confidentiality, high alcohol consumption, um, higher suicide rates, digital inequalities, um, partly relating to service access, uh, engagement, and the double edged sword of living in small communities. So, um, the notion that they can be supportive um, and close knit, um, but can sometimes feel um, stifling and that people feel uh, too. Uh, visible within um, smaller communities. But from that um, research evidence, there seems to be a strong support for forms of connection that sustain mental well-being. Um, and I think importantly, community-led approaches um, and place-based approaches to mental health and well-being. So um, thinking about linking into how might we be able to modify those different types of environments and those social determinants of mental health um, to support uh, positive mental health and well-being. So I do want to um, highlight one of the more uh, recent studies um, that we've carried out. So this was around use of the mini Delphi method um, with rural community members to consider topics uh, relating to mental health. Um, and we, um, or Delphi is often uh, used as a, a questionnaire method, um, but we use this um, in, uh, in person um, within a small group setting. So the, the principle of uh, Delphi is that uh, decisions from a structured group of experts um, are likely to be more accurate than those from unstructured groups. Um, and positioning this within um, the kind of way in which we work, um, we felt community members are the people who are experts in their own mental health needs um, and therefore wanted to test could this uh, work as a way of um, uh, reaching some uh, consensus and dialogue uh, within community members uh, themselves. So they answer questions, discuss questions um, in a series of, of rounds of dialogue. There's a facilitator within the, the process who summarises the um, outputs after each round um, and then requests some revisions and makes those revisions so everyone um, has sight of them. Um, this goes on for a few rounds um, and over time, the kind of range of answers uh, decreases and people converge um, on one agreed answer to the, the question that's being posed. So this um, it notion, it, it first emerged um, when I was on a, a visiting uh, fellowship um, out in rural Texas, right down in South Texas um, near the uh, Mexican border. Um, with colleagues from Texas A&M, uh, Steve Bain and Kelly Hall, um, and they piloted this first um, within those rural uh, South Texan communities, looking to try and understand um, mental health um, issues and potential solutions within those uh, rural communities. So they're very um, dispersed and small and agricultural um, communities that they were working with. Um, and we uh, looked to replicate this within um, the Highlands and Islands and carried out uh, similar workshops within Stornoway um, and on the Black Isle um, in Highlands. So what I'll do today is focus on the findings from uh, the Stornoway uh, workshop. So in terms of setting up the project, um, we had ethics approval from the university. 
We recruited the participants through social media, um, the local press, and our personal contacts within third sector um, and um, staff and students um, of UHI. So we included a lunch for participants and everyone also received a local shopping voucher to say thank you for taking part. Um, and we looked to run this in as accessible a venue as possible with um, as good public transport links as we could um, identify. So within um, the workshop in the Western Isles, uh, we had nine uh, participants in that uh, Stored Away workshop, aged between 23 and 62. Um, two were not employed, uh, the others were in part-time or full-time employment. Um, and as you can see, working in the local authority, social care, health, education, um, or the third sector. So within the workshop itself, we asked a series of three questions, which mirrored those that were asked in, in South Texas. Um, and what I'd like to do is run through those consensus answers that were generated by the workshop groups. Um, so what I'll, I'll present is the um, output from the, the rounds of dialogue within the process. So we'll start with the first question, which was that one um, around mental health and asking in the small groups people to discuss what does mental health mean to you? Um, and we've got the consensus answer from that uh, Stormy group. So mental and physical health are intertwined, but physical health is viewed as separate and easier to treat. Mental health is a broad term often with negative connotations and perceptions. It can affect people directly or indirectly. A lack of understanding leads to depersonalization, shame, fear and stigma. So I think um, this is a really interesting um, and quite nuanced um, answer. There's quite a lot, I think, contained um, within that. Um, and we'll see some of the um, concepts and themes traced through the answers to the second and, and third questions as well. So, um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to reflect, I guess, on whether um, others uh, agree that mental health often has this negative connotation. Um, I think the identification of a lack of understanding um, is very interesting um, and linking that to depersonalization, shame, fear and stigma. Um, I think at the same time that kind of suggests that if this is about understanding, there is also the possibility for change. Um, and for us, I think, um, interesting to think about how these things might be played out within um, other island populations and communities. So the second question um, that we considered what are the biggest mental health issues or needs you see facing this community? And again, we've got the consensus answer from the Stornoway group. So they said there are multiple issues regarding mental health facing the community. A resistance to change in the wider community stems from a lack of understanding and compassion. There's no parity of care when comparing mental health services to physical health. There's a gap between what the community needs and what statutory services, such as the NHS and social care, can provide. Issues with recruitment and retention mean a lack of professionals working on the front line. Reliance on locums leads to a lack of continuity of care. As a result, there's a lack of early intervention no crisis care and no out of hours services. Locals attempt to fill this gap with third sector or community groups, but this raises challenges of training and funding for such groups. So I think in identifying this um, consensus answer, the, the Stornoway group flag some uh, pertinent rural 
mental health issues that we can see across um, other um, areas and, and within the wider literature as well. So I think it's important they've recognised that there's multiple issues. So this is not just one thing um, going on, it's a complex um, situation and it's challenging to understand and to, to try to address. Um, there's that um, notion again of a, of a lack of understanding. So thinking about um, attitudinal um, concepts, people's own perceptions, beliefs, um, and possibly how these are um, associated with place and how that can affect um, people's experience of mental health and well-being. I think we can see again that notion that um, statutory provision is not enough, that there's some kind of gap between need um, and level of provision. Um, highlighting that uh, continuity of care, I think, is something, again, that people actually um, worry about um, as, as, in addition to access to services. Um, and important, I think, as well, that they highlight, again, the community sector, um, which is often a really essential um, support and an, and an essential service provider um, within rural communities. And I think probably even more so during the, the pandemic. Um, but recognising that the there is often a limited capacity um, within the rural third sector, um, and they may be um, dealing with quite short-term funding and, and short-term funding cycles that can limit um, what they could do and the services that they can provide as well. So I'll move on to the final question, um, which we discussed, which was, um, what solutions would you suggest that would meet the mental health needs of your community? And, and again, this is the, the consensus answer um, that emerged. Um, a proactive rather than a reactive approach is needed. Co-production of services will enhance personalization, community compassion and a will for change along with education at all levels from school age onwards, can raise awareness and reduce stigma. Quality, consistency and continuity of statutory services will ensure excellence in care, which can then be complemented by third sector or community groups and peer support. Such complementary services need to be fully resourced and supported. Ongoing community-based research can inform policy and practice, ensuring needs continue to be met within the community. So again, I think that's um, a really insightful um, answer that, that emerged from the group. Um, and hopefully you can see those kind of threads that, that are traced through from the, the first answer through um, to this conclusion um, around, for example, their understandings of mental health um, and what they feel is needed. Uh, within the community. So I think um, the notion that something needs to be proactive um, or preventative um, is important. Um, and also the notion of co-production and that um, service uh, design and service delivery should involve um, people uh, themselves, um, patients, family members, carers, etc. Uh, compassion, community compassion, understanding, attitudes and attitudinal barriers um, come out again um, in the third um, answer, um, as does that uh, sense of need for, for more from, from statutory services. Um, the community sector is flagged again, um, but we also recognise here, I think, the potential fragility um, of that uh, reliance on, on the third sector. Um, and perhaps the the need for it to be um, more fully or more formally integrated within our, our health uh, and care systems. So I think there's lots to think about there in terms of how um, these uh, potential areas for solutions could actually be, be played out, particularly within um, the island setting. Um, so those were the three consensus answers, um, which I hope you find uh, interesting um, and perhaps um, you might be able to reflect on how this chimes with your own um, experiences, your own thoughts um, or the situations within which you um, live um, and work. So I think that um, 
I mentioned that the workshop itself, I think, draws out some key themes um, across Scottish island communities and also um, some of the rural mainland communities, particularly the peninsula um, communities that we've worked with. So um, what I've tried to do is draw out what I think some of the key implications um, from, from the work might be um, for the future of, of health services and also our, our own research. So um, I think there's quite a strong theme around stigma and perceptions of, of stigma related to mental health um, and not just mental illness and diagnosed illness. Um, and I think we can see it's, it's quite a strong theme around um, people feeling there's a need for attitudinal change um, and seeing that as some kind of foundation um, that would allow other interventions or other solutions to then um, be, be put into place. Um, in some of the discussion, I think there's quite strong um, criticism around current statutory services. Um, that might uh, or isn't necessarily in terms of the quality um, of care that's delivered, um, but more about length of time, uh, waiting time to access care, um, and also um, other issues around physical and social access to services. Um, and that lack of continuity is something that, that worries people. Um, I think there are wider implications around that notion of depersonalisation um, that was mentioned um, several times. Um, so I think that um, there's, a, there's a recognition there that services need to be place-based, they need to be place-specific, culturally, socially appropriate, um, but they also need to recognise each individual um, as somebody with their own particular set of circumstances. Um, and their own interactions with social determinants of health, um, if we're going to support um, people in that, that person-centred um, way. Um, I think there are um, wider discussions that need to happen around um, that kind of desire for a community-based response, um, and one that's pre preferably preventative. Um, how do we enable that to um, play out, particularly in our um, rural and smaller communities. Uh, mental health education is again something that links to um, the wider literature, um, as does the uh, discourse around the third sector um, and the need for better funding um, and resources for the activity um, that they do. So I thought just briefly um, it might be interesting to um, compare with the results uh, from South Texas. Uh, so the consensus statements from South Texas were much shorter, um, and um, just I, I've just outlined them here for you. So the first one around what does mental health mean to you? Um, their answer was the capacity to process challenges and setbacks in life at a spiritual, physical, and emotional level while discovering resources to cope. When they asked what are the biggest mental health issues or needs you see facing the community, the answer was around specific resources are lacking. And that was resources that provide programmes, funding and outreach pertaining to mental health. And for the solutions question, their consensus answer was um, for openly available professional services for families and organisations to promote mental health. So just some um, final thoughts before we um, finish up with the, the presentation. Um, I think it's been, well, I've, I've found it very interesting to um, look at this uh, in-person Delphi method. Um, I think it's been useful um, in helping us work with community members as experts. Um, it did help us reach consensus um, within West Isles and, and the, the workshop we did within the Black Isle as well. I think um, the answers that have come out are, are insightful, they're really pertinent, and they do link to, to wider um, themes and challenges um, that help us um, identify what are the, the community priorities um, that we can um, incorporate, for example, into research. Um, I think it would be really interesting to look at whether the same kind of thing happens if we did this on a wider scale and um, potentially with more people contributing. 
And there's also um, a question around whether we could facilitate some kind of digital um, engagement, which um, would not require people to, to travel um, to a central location. Um, and for us as well, it's going to be important to think about whether the type of output from uh, this method is helpful for uh, helping to shape policy and practice as well. So um, we are looking at, at trying to do a larger study, which would be in uh, collaboration with uh, Texas A&M as well. So hopefully I've shown that I think the, the themes from the Delphi um, work uh, link to wider rural health literature. So um, one next step, I think, is to look at the different contexts of, of different rural areas and different island groupings to try and understand more um, for me particularly about what types of place-based support and services are helpful um, and might be physically and socially acceptable and, and effective and accessible. Um, and I just wanted to come back to um, Dr. Heaton's mapping review. Um, and I do um, recommend if you're interested, have a look because there are some uh, great suggestions for kind of future research directions in there. And I've just highlighted a few um, which I think really particularly to what's come out um, of the Delphi as well. So, for example, thinking about what configurations of in-person and remote, so thinking about in-person and, and digital, for example, um, mental health consultation work best for island residents. I think that really chimes with the, the discussions we had in, in the Western Isles. Um, a need for more uh, longitudinal methods, so looking at change over time, and I think you know things shift, um, and trying to map how how that happens and why um, in relation to different kinds of environmental influence would be very useful. Um, the review also suggests that more comparative, in-depth, qualitative research would be useful. Um, I think that's definitely what we need to understand more about. Um, individual experience and the nature of place and connections between uh, mental health and, and the nature of place. Uh, it calls also for an investigation of factors involved in death by suicide. Um, it was not something that we particularly talked about in the West Isles. It did come up a lot more in the discussion um, in the Black Isle. Um, but there's evidence that um, age standardised uh, rates are higher in some of the island groups. Um, something I think is really important as well um, as a future research direction is mental health and well-being of our healthcare staff. Um, and I think I'd add um, into that our third sector staff as well who are um, supporting um, sometimes quite vulnerable people through um, difficult times at the moment. Um, and also more research to look at the benefits of the natural environment and cultural activities for mental health and well-being. Um, and we can think about how the third sector community groups might facilitate access to those uh, types of activities and spaces um, and whether we can use these assets within place based approaches, the kind of preventative approach um, that uh, the community members talked about within uh, the Delphi workshop in the Western Isles. So I think um, there's lots of potential work uh, going forward uh, for me, particularly around those uh, place-based interventions. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions, have any discussion just now, um, and also for anyone to get in touch who's interested. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sarah Ann. Um, yeah, well, I, I had some questions and then your concluding remarks sort of... Uh... <laughs> Answer them, but that uh, won't stop me ask, asking them again. Um, he, just uh, one of the things that um, I've got a, a couple of questions on the chat there, just to try and encourage other people to uh, note things down. Um, but is Shetland well represented in the literature? You said that uh, the Western Isles were, but Orkney wasn't. Yes, I think Shetland's probably somewhere in the middle. So I think that there are some studies that. In include Shetland. It might not be Shetland specific. Um, it'd be better to, ch to check the review itself. Um, but I think um, probably West Wales and Orkney are kind of two extremes and there is some evidence, yeah, for Shetland. Do you happen to know why there's so much been done in the Western Isles? No. <laughs> I 
think I think it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure whether that's um, yeah a, a slightly more accessible location for um, researchers from the Central Belt might be one of the the reasons. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. That um, that could well be. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, uh, just um, you mentioned uh, third sector and community groups, and Shetland has a, a very well known one here, Mind Your Head, which was created in two thousand and five, um, which seems to be, you know, has a, quite a big role, uh, looking after people's um, mental health here in Shetland and um, well you meant as you mentioned other groups so there must be other things similar things in in the other Scottish islands uh, do you have to know what they what they're doing and what their names are yeah I, mean, I think there's some um, kind of national you know third sector charitable groups um, I think Penumbra is one which operates I know it's certainly in Stornoway people um, talked about the um, activities they did to support um, youth mental health um, giving or providing spaces for young people to come together um, to talk and to engage in activities um, I think for me one of the other interesting um, things that people talked about in the Western Isles were the um, the local um, the land. Uh, I'm going to say land trust. I'm not sure that's the right phrase, but the community, yeah, community, the community land trust who um, put on um, a series of of activities. For example, things like walking groups, um, engagement with nature. Um, again engagement with things like crafting activities, which can have both a kind of social connection element, um, as well as um, a kind of restorative element through making or through um, engaging with the natural landscape. So um, that was it. That was interesting for me as well. It's obviously linked with community um, ownership of land and that that going beyond and going into actually um, facilitating social connection and um, activities that can support uh, mental health and well-being. So, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. It, absolutely. Um, communities sort of involved in sustaining um, mm. good uh, mental health. Um, it's a very important aspect of, 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 uh, of life and uh, further research. And um, I see we've got some questions coming in now as well. So there's one from Ruth Wilson. Um, do you have a sense of whether the stigma around mental illness is changing? Uh, mental health seems to be talked about more openly these days in the media and in workplaces. And I wonder if this is having an impact in island communities. Yeah, I would have, I would have agreed with that as well. And I think that um, my own feeling from speaking to people is that um, young younger people are maybe more um, at ease with speaking about mental health, um, and I've connected in with things like yeah the discussions on social media, um, for example. Um, but actually, in in both workshops, it was quite a strong um, theme uh, that people felt there was still um, a, a feeling of stigma. It, it, you know. I think interestingly as well, people talked about it in relation to their experience of um, poverty and deprivation sometimes, and that that was, um, I guess, due to the, the nature of rural communities, sometimes people felt um, they were maybe living in quite, you know, hard, difficult times, but they were surrounded by people who were, were not, um, and they felt that, that they were having yeah, a different experience um, and that impacted their own perception. Um, so I think that sometimes it was more about how people felt about themselves than necessarily encountering um, any direct prejudice from others, but that didn't make it any less impactful um, on their own yeah, experience and their own mental health. Um, and yeah, I think I think things probably are changing, and um, it it came up um, more than once. I think about 
the importance of um, activities within schools um, and starting to normalise a discussion of mental health. Um, yeah, from from you know kind of high school onwards, so that it's it's something that we're potentially more comfortable with. So. Thank you. And um, uh, Liz Ellis has a comment here. She says it's not a question, but uh, there is actually a question in it. Um, more an observation as one of the facilitators from the Stornoway study is the difference between outputs from Texas and Stornoway. And uh, she wonders if it's due to facilitation differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good question or point, <laughs> whichever it is. Um, yeah, I think the role of the facilitator within the process is really important. Um, and I think um, within the yeah within the Texan workshops from from what I know about them, um, like I think they maybe went further down the route of trying to condense the answer, um, and in um, West Niles and also in, in the Black Isle as well, um, we were happier to to kind of keep more um, within uh, the consensus answer. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not a process where you can divorce the um, influence of the facilitator. They're a very big part of yeah what emerges. Even uh, saying that the the words come from the participants themselves. Um, but I think it's about uh, yeah how far down the line do you go with reducing um, that that reduction process? Yeah, thank you. And uh, Thomas um, Thomas Fisher uh, uh, says it'd be interesting to hear what you what you think, uh, Sarah Sarah uh, uh, Sarah Ann. Um, the role of community organisations in this field is huge. In the past, um, uh, Western Isles Council worked effectively with third sector organisations, funding them to deliver services in remote areas. Unfortunately, austerity has undermined this significantly, with Corlean and Aileen Shear increasingly bringing services in house. But there is at least part experience of good practice. The NHS board has been less active in engaging and funding community organisations, even though they are critical for mental health solutions. There are so many barriers of organisational culture and not least confidentiality, which stymies more active at more activity by community groups. So, yeah, a comment on the reality of providing yes. services. Yeah, absolutely. And I think links to um, lots of themes that we see in other areas of support for long term conditions that are provided by the, the rural third sector. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, for me, um, if we could sort data sharing um, and be, I'm going to use the word trust, but like if, if third sector organisations, yeah, could be seen as trusted um partners with access to data i think that would be very helpful um i would agree that particularly in in our rural and island communities that the third your know, third sector are providing a huge amount of support and services to the community um and i'd like to see that recognized as an an integral an integral part of our our health and and care provision. Um, I don't see how we can, for example, um, continue to pursue policies around social prescribing and addressing the social dimensions of health unless we really fully embrace what the, the third sector are doing and what they can provide, which I think is it goes beyond and it's different to what the statutory sector um, can provide. So I, I don't have an answer, although I do think data sharing would help. Um, I think more more formal integration would help, um, and funding wherever we could get it from. Um, yeah, you know we can't we can't expect um, third sector organisations to provide services without suitable funding. So. Thank you, and um, Simon um, has uh, come up with a question that sort of. Um, it's related to what I was wanting to ask. So, um, and it relates to, to place and, and community and whether islands are uh, different from mainlands. Um, is mental health uh, different in some way in an island community than, say, in, in 
the centre of Glasgow. So he's asking, does poor mental health manifest itself differently in our communities with regard to self-harm, eating disorders, suicide, uh, or with regard to the age and gender presenting? That's a really good question. I think that um, we don't have a lot of data is the other problem um, in trying to answer some of these questions. Um, the statistic, I think, that most people um, are, are probably familiar with is the age standardised suicide rates. So um, they are higher in, um, let me get it right, but I think it's Western Isles and Orkney um, and lower than the Scottish average in Shetland. I think that's right. Um, and it's um, particularly for young men. Um, in Western Isles and, and Orkney. Um, I don't have the, the data in terms of other um, you know, levels of, of diagnosis of other um, conditions. Um, but I mean, what I would say is that every, I feel every place is, is different. So the key thing is trying to understand the contextual influence of the place that we're, we're looking at. Um, I think that yeah, it's 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 about understanding the nature of that that particular place. So different preventative measures depending on the different places. Um, yeah, I'm going to ask a naive question, but um, it was actually whittled down by the uh, the Texans. And how do you define good mental health? Yeah. I mean, mental health is a sort of should shouldn't be negative or positive. It's just you know, a statement, but how do you define good mental health and particularly in an island context? Well, I mean, there's, it, it, I would say, um, according to an individual's perception, like, do you feel well? That would be my um, standard, I suppose. Um, but there, I mean, there's different measures you can use. The one that the we've got population level data on is called the Edinburgh Warwick um, Mental Wellbeing Scale. Um, so again, that's Quite interesting looking at the geography of that. It's at local authority level, um, but it tends to come out as um, higher than average in, in rural areas of Scotland and, and the island uh, groupings as well. So um, that's why you get that kind of headline that it, people are happy in rural areas are the happiest places to live. Um, but I think it depends on um, how you like your own perception of how you're answering <laughs> that scale. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's something that's personal to to each individual when we talk about mental well being. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I don't know whether you can see the chat, but there are there are three interesting comments. Um, uh, one from Rebecca and two from Liz about um, what Thomas has said, and also Liz has got a comment about um, something that didn't make it into the final statement. I'm trying to find that. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about the role of community in preventing poor mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and also in um, the Black Isle when we, we did that um, workshop again. Um, so I think those types of social connections and social bonds that I mentioned before is perhaps what, what Liz is thinking about as well. Um, and yeah, some people talked about it almost being like a buffer um, against escalation. So if you're you're watching out and you're familiar with people, and you might be able to pick up on if they need a bit of extra support just now. So yeah. Um, and what was the other comment? So confidentiality. Some participants argued it was impossible on the island, which is why. Solutions around destigmatization and community developed services are important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very it's very difficult to completely maintain confidentiality in a small um, community. Um, I think especially if you're having to travel to a particular location to access services. So, um, some of the dialogue I've had as well with with community members is about like the physical location of where services are. Can we do things like have um, access from a library 
um, or a community centre, so um, people feel less, um, yeah, less visible, less visibility to say that's why you're you're entering that space. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you feel that sometimes if something is kept um, you know, secret, then um, it can be stigmatised? If it's more, if people are more open about these things, then it becomes normalised, and yeah. um, people can then accept it and help rather mm -hmm. than sort of keeping it locked yeah. up in the cupboard somewhere. Yeah, and I think maybe if it's like less medicalised as well, um, and that's. I think where the community support and the third sector come in to, um, it's just it's part of how we function as um, rural communities and how we yeah function as as humans with compassion to support each other. So yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you sort of uh, uh, mentioned briefly uh, where you think the research might go uh, next, but I wondered if you wanted to say a few more words about that and then we can wrap things up. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've maintained the, the link with um, Texas A&M. It's really um, interesting to see some of the similarities and, and differences um, between rural Scotland, rural Texas. Um, and we're extending that um, partnership, hopefully to work with um, other uh, countries, um, so Canada and um, potentially Australia. Um, so we'd really like to do something um, that has an international comparative element. Um, and I think that would help us uh, think about the specific nature of place um, and do yeah, some more com community engaged work. Um, and I think um, within the, the Scottish context, we would definitely like to be doing some more um, community engagement. Um, and perhaps look at uh, trying to involve people who might not normally um, come forward to take part um, and think about whether there are different um, ways for people to engage. So I think this worked well for those that were comfortable with coming to an in-person um, event and speaking in small groups, um, but there may well be people that are not yeah, happy to access that way. So it's how do we actually get those um, voices um, as well to be to be part of the dialogue. So that sounds very interesting. And uh, yeah, the international comparison. Mm -hmm. I always think that's a good one, particularly in the island um, sphere. Um, well, there's been lots of activity in the in the chat there, and um, Thomas has, has uh, provided a very useful uh, link for everyone to to have a look at. Um, and uh, he's also said that uh, place is a great concept to focus on and it relates so strongly to culture, identity, etc. and needs to be brought into focus um, as well. And uh, I think we we'll heartily agree with that. Um, so, well, I think unless there's any further comments you'd like to, to make, Sarah Ann? No, I think that's great. It's um, thanks for all the the comments in the chat as well, which I'll I'll have a look through. Um, and yeah, if anybody wants to to get in touch, any other points, just feel free. Well, thank you very much indeed for your talk today and some very stimulating um, thoughts and um, some opportunities for for further research and for um, participation by others as well in it so and thank you everyone for your your comments it's been a very um yeah very lively session and um i think we'll we'll draw it to an end there this will be the last islands matter for this year but um keep looking at the ins website because there will be more um webinars starting next semester so thanks again sarah ann and i'll see you in an hour's time yes <laughs> that's great thanks everyone I know.